So what is a behavioral sleep problem? Well, 20 to 30% of young children have some type of sleep disturbance and many persist. And there's this wonderful longitudinal study that's happened in Quebec. They started off with about 2,500 kids and they followed them from the time that they were five months old and I think the kids are now about eight or nine years old. And they've been, they, they incorporated sleep measures in the study, thank the Lord. So um, they keep pumping out these articles on this longitudinal sleep study and telling us about what's happening with these kids. And um, they looked at these kids from three months of age to six years and they found that kids who were sleeping less than six consecutive hours at five months of age, so think about that for a minute, this is when they're five months old, represented the highest percentage, and that was 32%, of persistent short night sleepers at six years of age. So what they're finding is that these sleep patterns that get set up when these kids are in their infancy, for a significant proportion of kids, are getting carried through into their early childhood years. And I have to say that usually parents decide whether a child has a sleep problem or not. There's a lot of difference in terms of what parents consider good sleep, in quotation marks, and not good sleep. Some parents philosophically from the get-go decide they're going to co-sleep with their children. And I have no problem with that as long as they do it safely. So there's a lot of guidelines about safe co-bedding. Um, but they have philosophically decided that that's what they're going to do and they are absolutely consistent in that they have a family bed and they co-sleep with their, their child. There are other parents who do what we call reactive co-sleeping. And reactive co-sleeping is what parents do when they've tried everything else and they're desperate and they haul the kid into bed with them in the middle of the night because they're desperate to get sleep and they can't figure out any other way to do it. That is not um, such a good way of co-sleeping and that is, um, an area, that is a group of parents who would define their kids when they're waking up at night as having a sleep problem. Some parents are very tolerant of night waking. So it might happen two or three times a night and they'll just say, oh well, it's one of those things and I don't really define it as a sleep problem and I deal with it. But what I, the people I deal with are the parents who do define it as a sleep problem, who are getting sleep deprived themselves, who are getting fatigued. And in many cases, the moms I'm talking to tell me they're depressed. They're crying on the other end of the phone. They can't um, problem solve. They're so sleep deprived that they don't know whether they're coming or going. And they're just in this constant kind of haze of sleep deprivation. So. Um, those moms would define their child as having a sleep problem. Now, unfortunately, there isn't always agreement in families about what constitutes a sleep problem. So I had my mom who called me who was on antidepressants and was very depressed and very much wanted to deal with her child's sleep problem, but her partner did not agree with her about how she wanted to handle the problem. And so eventually she just gave up trying to do it because her partner undermined her efforts to try and solve this problem. So one of the things you have to make sure is if you're going to try and tackle these problems with parents, they have to be on the same page. Because if they don't agree with each other and they're not willing to support each other around the interventions that you're suggesting, they aren't going to work. Because one parent will undermine what the other parent is trying to do. So as I've already said, the difference between good, good um, sleepers and poor sleepers is this inability to self-soothe after waking. There's more and more literature coming out now that's suggesting that there is nothing about sleep that's associated with insecure attachment. I know the Benoit study came out a few years ago. I forget when that one was published. It's probably, not, it might have even been in the 1990s. At the very uh, early, latest, it was in 2000. And she found this association between ambivalent um, or insecure attachment and sleep. And this has caused an enormous uproar. And you know, you've got um, people out there who fall into what I would call the attachment parenting group who argue that we shouldn't be trying to deal with sleep problems because it undermines attachment and it, it's going to affect children and they're going to be psychologically damaged by our efforts to try and solve these sleep problems and it's going to have lifelong effects on them. Well, there is absolutely no evidence over the last 30 years from the interventions that have been undertaken with children that it in any way undermines attachment or has any psychological negative effects on these kids. So, and what I'm going to explain to you later in the presentation is <coughs> that um, more and more evidence is coming out that these short sleep durations are having profound effects on these children's ability to function. So um, it's kind of in, in effect the other way around. 
The importance about self-soothing, I can't overemphasize. It is a skill that children learn when they are infants, self-soothing. And it's a building block for their ability to self-soothe and regulate their emotions later on. So if they can't figure out how to self-soothe in infancy, and sleep is one of the places where they first learn about how to do this, and they're constantly relying totally on parental intervention to get any of their anxieties or frustrations under control, they're not going to function very well when they get into um, play school settings or daycare settings or preschool settings where they're dealing with other kids and they're finding themselves frustrated or they find themselves experiencing something that is difficult. They're not going to be able to calm themselves down and self-regulate very well. And that is, um, we're, we've had one study just published, one part of the study where we looked at um, kids that were one to three in community settings, so they were in daycares, and we ended up having a sleep problem group and a non-sleep problem group, and in the sleep problem group, the cortisol levels uh, for the sleep problem kids were higher, and it was associated with less sleep efficiency. So the kids who had less sleep efficiency had these higher cortisol levels, but also the paper I've just submitted for publication indicated that both parents and daycare providers felt that the kids with sleep problems were showing more aggressive behavior, less attention, less able to focus, et cetera. And this is between one and three years old. So it's happening early on. So this is really, really important, having this self-regulatory capacity and, and building on that. And the building blocks are set up for these children in infancy. And so a behavioral sleep problem happens when children require parental intervention to fall asleep and to return to sleep when they come up into these periods of semi-wakefulness at night. And insufficient sleep occurs um, when sleep time is shorter than the age-appropriate norms and the child is showing evidence of sleep loss. So we have to pay attention to that because it's two things. Because there is variability in sleep and some children do do okay with less sleep at night. So we have to make sure we're paying attention to, is there evidence of sleep loss in this child? And we're not just sticking the age-appropriate norms on them because there is variability that can happen in sleep and we do need to take that into consideration. Okay, okay. so major um, behavioral sleep problems are major causes of disturbed sleep and daytime sleepiness. And they're really caused by sleep onset associations that I'm gonna get into in more detail. Limit setting problems, and those are more common in toddlers. So as the children get older, it's I want one more drink, I want one more story, I want one more this, I want one more that. And the bedtime routine, instead of being 10 or 15 minutes, ends up stretching into two to three hours. So that's a limit setting problem more than a um, uh, sleep onset association, although that is often linked into it. There's inadequate what we call sleep hygiene, and I'm going to get into a little bit more depth about describing what sleep hygiene is and when it's inadequate. But we do have to differentiate behavioral sleep problems from sleep apnea syndrome. And so whenever I talk to families, and in the, ra in the randomized control trial we're doing now in Vancouver, where we're testing out an intervention, and it's called the Rocky Sleep Study, um, we do have a whole series of questions that we ask parents while we're um, recruiting them for the study to make sure that these kids aren't having a behavioral, uh, aren't having a, a sleep apnea syndrome because we don't want to be trying to treat kids with a sleep apnea syndrome for behavioral sleep problems. That's inappropriate. They have some underlying pathophysiology that's going on that's interfering with their sleep and that underlying pathophysiology has to be resolved. So um, we do have to be clear on when it's a behavioral sleep problem and when it, there's uh, a pathophysiological problem going on. We define a behavioral sleep problem as waking two or more times per night or more than 20 minutes per night for more than two months or taking more than 20 minutes to settle. But I generally find when I'm working with these families that it's way more than two or more times a night. Um, in some of these families, they've been dealing with infants that have been waking hourly to two hourly for a year. So every night for a year these babies have been waking up. And in, on the odd occasion, when they do sleep through the night, which might happen once in a three or four month cycle, the parents are afraid that something dire has happened to them and run into the room to make sure that they're okay because they're so um, accustomed to waking up every one to two hours that they can't believe that their child would have slept for, for longer than that. 